but all things are from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself, received us into favor, brought us into harmony with himself, and gave to us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19, it was God personally present in Christ, reconciling and restoring the world to favor with himself. There it is again. Not counting up and holding against men their trespasses, but canceling them. And giving to them then the message of reconciliation. You see, I'm so excited about what I know that God has done for me. And I'm so excited that I've been reconciled to God through Christ and that he's given me favor and canceled my sins that now I want to bring that message of reconciliation to other people. And that's how the gospel spread. But if you don't ever get excited about what God's done for you, you're not going to care very much about telling it to somebody else. But when you get excited enough, you will have a hard time keeping your mouth shut. And let me just throw this out because I'd like to say it at least once in every conference. Jesus didn't die so you could have a religion. He died so you could have a deep, intimate, personal relationship with God through him. And one of the reasons why so many people feel so defeated is because sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes religious organizations just give you a pile of rules and regulations to follow. Do this, do that, do this, do that, do this, do that. Cut your hair, grow your hair, change your clothes, do this. Take your makeup off, get your jewelry off, on and on and on and on. And you're so busy in the outward doing of everything and failing all the time. And so you just feel more and more miserable. Wonder what would happen if we could stand in church on Sunday morning and say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. I have favor with God. My sins have been forgiven. Verse 30, right, 20. 2 Corinthians 5, 20. So we are Christ's ambassadors. Hallelujah. God making his appeal, as it were, through us. <laughs> We as Christ's personal representatives beg you for his sake to lay hold of this divine favor now offered to you and be reconciled to God. So I'm coming to you tonight with the same message that Paul went to the Romans with. I beg you to be reconciled to Christ. I beg you to believe what the Bible says, to believe that your debts have been canceled. To believe that God is not mad at you. That you don't have to live under guilt and condemnation. That your past does not have to dictate your future. And I'm not just giving you some way to, to get, get, get off with living a sloppy life. I mean, I'm talking to people who love God and want to do the best that they can. And they are doing that daily. But in the midst of that, we make mistakes. He says, I beg you to lay hold of this favor that's being offered to you as a free gift and be reconciled to God. You should think things like, God loves me. He is not mad at me. God has got a good plan for my life. I have right standing with God. You will get so excited. You will feel the presence of God. You'll begin to know more clearly when God is dealing with you. Now, one of my favorite scriptures, verse 21, for our sake, for our sake, say for my sake. He made Christ virtually to be sin, who knew no sin. So that in and through him, we might become endued with viewed as being in and examples of the righteousness of God, which is what we ought to be, approved and acceptable and in right relationship with him by his goodness. Now, the fact is you may not be doing everything right, but the truth of God's word overrides even facts. 
The world is all caught up in the facts. Well, I've got something greater than the facts. I've got the truth. Amen? And I think there's a lot of confusion about that. Facts are facts and they're real and this may be what the doctor says and this may be what the boss says and this may be what the spouse says, but we have the truth of the Word of God. Your who is not based on your do. Even though God will deal with us about what we do when we have bad behavior, that doesn't change who I am. If one of my children do something wrong, they're still Myers. And if you do something wrong, you're still a child of God. And as his child, he's going to keep working with you, teaching you how to walk. Everything is based on what Jesus did, not what we do. You know, the Bible says that we, we easily received sin through Adam. We don't have any problem with that. Oh, yeah. Adam passed it on to me. I took it. I'm a sinner. <laughs> Nobody has a problem with that. But then when the Bible says, through that one man we received sin, why then can we not through the one man, Jesus Christ, receive righteousness? <laughs> why is it so easy to receive sin from Adam, but so hard to receive righteousness from Christ? Woo! Romans chapter 5, let me show you a couple of these scriptures, verse 12. Therefore, as sin came into the world through one man, and death as the result of sin, so death spread to all men, no one being able to stop it or to escape its power, because all men had sinned. And boy, we say, amen. Amen. I got it. Got that sin from Adam. Verse 15. But God's free grace... Is not at all to be compared to the trespass. <laughs> His grace is out of all proportion to the fall of man. For if many died through one man's falling away, his lapse, his offense, much more profusely did God's grace and the free gift that comes through the undeserved favor of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to and overflow for the benefit of the many. And then he says it again in verse 17. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one, much more surely then will those who receive God's overflowing grace and the free gift of righteousness, which puts them into right standing with himself, now listen, reign as kings in life, reign as kings in life. You don't like your life? You need to find out who you are in Christ. You need to stop receiving what Adam gives you and start receiving what Christ wants to forgive, give you on a daily basis. Then you begin, can begin to reign as a king in life. You don't have to let the devil walk all over you all the time. Because then you can say, I'm a child of God. A joint heir. And devil, you are not going to disinherit me through your lies. You are not going to use my mind as a garbage dump, and I am not going to ride to work this morning thinking about everything I did wrong yesterday, and how bad I am, and how much I've missed it, and how my prayer life's probably no good. No, I am going to ride to work doing my own thinking. And what I think today is I am in right standing with God. I am in right standing with God. And if you have done something wrong, then repent and admit it. God, I did that. I'm sorry. There's no excuse for it. I ask you to forgive me. Help me not to continue on in that way. Study your word. Listen to the word because the word is the strength that you need to overcome temptation. But in the midst of all that, you need to know who you are in Christ. Let's go to 2 Samuel 9. You doing okay with this? You getting it? Everybody say, I think that I have right standing with God. <laughs> Woo. That's right. I know I have right standing with God. All right, 2 Samuel chapter 9. And see what happens is when you think it long enough, then you will begin to know it. 
but a lot of people are trying to know something that they don't ever even think about. Okay, I know Samuel's in here. <laughs> there he is. Second Samuel 9. Really, this whole chapter needs to be read to do it justice, and I don't want to take the time to read the whole thing, so I'm going to kind of tell you what's going on. Let's just look at verse 1. David said, is there still anyone left of the house of Saul to whom I might show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now that's not really any different than God looking down here and saying, is there anybody down there that I can be good to for Jesus' sake? Exact same situation. David and Jonathan were blood covenant friends. And when people had blood covenant with one another in the Old Testament, it included any and all of their family members. In other words, if I'm a good friend of yours and you have a kid in trouble, then because I love you, I'm going to help your kid. You got it? So Jonathan was dead. Saul was dead. David was king. But he had this desire in him to bless any of Jonathan's relatives that might be left anywhere just because of how much he loved Jonathan. So he went looking for somebody to bless. And God is looking for somebody to bless. And if you don't believe me, look at Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18. Not right now, but you can look at it later. And it says that God is expecting, looking, and longing for someone that he can be gracious to and show favor to. And the one that he can do that for is someone who is waiting, looking, and longing for God to be gracious to them. So God's saying, who can I bless for Jesus' sake? And if you're smart, you'll be saying, me, me, woo-hoo, woo-hoo. But you know, to be honest with you, there's not very many people bold enough to do that. Because we're too busy hanging out in our rags and crawling around under the table eating crumbs. And <laughs> well, I mean, I can't just say, well, God, me, bless me. Well, if you don't, somebody else will shout and they'll get it. <laughs> and it may be me. <laughs> So then he found out that, sure enough, Jonathan had a son named Mephibosheth. Man, I'm glad that was not my name. <laughs> and actually, Mephibosheth was crippled in both of his feet. And that had taken place when word came to the palace that Saul and Jonathan were dead and that David was going to come and take over. Saul had lied to the people for so long that they were afraid of David, and so the nurse grabbed Mephibosheth, and as she was trying to run out of the palace with him, fell down the steps and crippled him in his feet. So he was living in a little town called Lodibar. 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 And it really wasn't a very nice place. It doesn't sound nice, and it wasn't nice either. Because you see, when you have a wrong image of yourself, then you will live a low lifestyle even though something else is available to you. Because it's all about how you view yourself. It's all about what you think about yourself, your own thinking. Be it unto you even as you believe. <laughs> Amen? Verse 6, Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, fell on his face, did obeisance, and David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold your servant. And David said to him, Fear not, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan your father's sake, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, your grandfather, and you will eat at my table always. And the cripple, watch verse 8, and the cripple bowed himself and said, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I am? Now right there we see why, although he was a blood relative of the king through covenant, that he was living out in Lodibar when he could have been eating at the king's table 
owning land, having privileges, having servants. The king would have given it all to him. All he had to do was go knock on the palace door. Why did he not go? Because he saw himself as a person that was crippled. I relate that to people with flaws and inabilities and people who make mistakes. And then it goes on to say, I don't really have time to read it all, but look at the last verse 13. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table, even though he was lame in both feet. So what does that mean? I can eat at the king's table, even though I still got a few flaws and a few little quirky things in my personality and Still sometimes my mouth gets me in trouble and still, still sometimes I lose my temper once in a while. Still sometimes I'm not as maybe loving and patient as I should be or I manifest a little bit of selfishness. I can ask God to forgive me and I can go right on in, sit down at the king's table and eat. I can reign as a king in life because God knows my heart that I'm sincere and I don't want to be that way. I want to change. So say it, I have right standing with God. Now the second thing I want to talk to you about tonight, a way that you need to think on purpose. Everybody say, think on purpose. Is I will not bow down to fear. I will not bow down to fear. Now let's just get it straight early that fear is never going to completely go away. When the Bible says God has not given you a spirit of fear, that does not mean that you will never feel fear. Matter of fact, really, when God told so many people in the Bible, fear not, fear not, fear not, he was basically telling them fear is going to come after you. When he gave Joshua the job of taking Moses' place and leading the Israelites into the promised land, he said, fear not, be courageous, be strong. Stay in the Word. Don't let the book of the law depart out of your mouth, but meditate on it day and night. Only you must not fear. Only you must not fear. Be very courageous. Well, what was, basically what he was saying to him was you got to keep going forward. No matter what you feel like, you know what I'm telling you to do. you got to keep putting one foot in front of the other one and just keep going forward because the word fear means to take flight or to run away from. The word fear does not mean to shake or quake or have a dry mouth or weak knees. Fear is not a feeling. Fear is an evil spirit that produces a feeling. And so when we say, I will not bow down to fear, what we mean is, I will not shrink back in fear. Fear causes us to shrink. Instead of having big faith, it causes us to have little faith. And if we mess with it long enough, we'll have no faith. Do not shrink back in fear. You may be going forward in something you feel like that God has spoken to you. Something happens that makes it look like it's not working out or something happens that makes it look like that people are not in favor of it. And maybe if you do this thing God wants you to do, you're going to lose some friends or lose some reputation or, you know, whatever. And so when you feel that fear, the first impulse is to begin to sh shrink back. So when God says, don't fear. What he literally means is no matter how you feel, you keep putting one foot in front of the other one and doing what you believe that I have told you to do. That's the only way that you can defeat fear. There's only one attitude that is acceptable for the Christian to have toward fear, and that is, I will not fear. I will not fear. So I want to encourage you to meditate on that statement and roll it over and over in your mind because setting your mind ahead of time that you're not going to bow down to fear will help you not to bow down to fear when fear comes. Are you with me? Just because you hear me say you don't have to be afraid doesn't mean that you won't be afraid the next time fear comes. But if you set your mind and you renew your mind, Now when fear comes, you'll remember what you've been thinking and meditating on 
And you'll already have made your mind up that when fear comes, you're not going to bow down to it. That you're going to do everything that God wants you to do, be all that God wants you to be, and have all that God wants you to have. So many people are ruled by fear. Destinies are destroyed because of fear. All kinds of fear. Fear of pain, fear of discomfort, fear of sacrifice. <laughs> fear that it's going to be hard. Fear that you'll have to do it all alone. Fear that you lose your reputation, you lose your friends, nobody's going to like you. People won't understand. <laughs> fear that you're missing God. What if it's not God? Fear, fear, fear. We receive from the devil through fear. And we receive from God through faith. All fear is, is the perversion of faith. It's the devil's brand of faith. He's saying, believe what I'm telling you. It's not going to work. Your prayers aren't any good. You don't have right standing with God. <laughs> Fear always tells us what we're not and what we don't and what we never will be. Romans 8.15 says that we did not receive the Holy Spirit of God to bring us once more into the bondage of fear. But we received the Spirit of God to help us live holy lives and to be bold. Bold, 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 courageous and bold, adventurous. You don't have to live in a little tiny box that the world has created for you all of your life. You need to shake that box until it falls, falls apart and you need to come out of it. Amen. I heard a story about a little boy that was crippled and I mean this is actually a true story and it was years ago when they didn't have a lot of this, the help for some of those diseases that they do today and so there was really nothing much that could be done for the boy so the doctors thought and his mother of all things made like a a little box for him out of an orange crate and she tied a rope to it and tied it around her waist and just kind of drug him along with her everywhere that she went so she could watch him. You know, as she was doing her housework, she'd just take him with her all the time. Well, he developed what she thought was a very irritating habit. He would rock his box all the time, which made it harder for her to deal with because now she not only had this box that she was dragging around, but he kept rocking the box. And she'd tell him not to, and he'd rock the box, and she'd tell him not to, and he'd rock the box. And sometimes he'd rock it so hard he'd turn it over, fall out of it, she'd put him back in it. <laughs> Isn't that kind of the way the world is? If you ever do get out of your box, they put you back in it. <laughs> Long story short, and to be honest, I wish I knew all the details better than, I, better than I do. I only heard this story one time, but that kid just kept it up and kept it up and kept it up and kept it up until he finally ended up getting out of that box, learning how to walk, and went on to have a superior life, all because he refused to stop rocking his box. <laughs> and some of you need to make a decision that you're going to rock your box also until the thing falls apart, and you're going to learn how to, to sit, and you're going to learn how to stand, and you're going to learn how to walk, and you're going to learn how to run your race, and you're going to do everything that God's got for you. If you're the only person you know that does it right, you're going to do it. Because one of our biggest fears is people, 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 people. Well, they say and they think, we don't even know who they are and we let them run our lives. <laughs> Did you ever stop to think about who they are? <laughs> you just listen to me. Well, you know, they say you can't wear that together. Well, you know, they, they, say, they say that's in now. Oh, well, they say that's out. They say, they say, one day I thought, who are they? They're running my life, and I don't even know who they are. Amen? 
So the next time somebody says they, you say, who are they? I want some names. <laughs> New way to think. I have right standing with God. And I will not bow down to fear. Well, I like to say where the mind goes, the man follows. What that means is we think a thing first and then we take action. So we must think things on purpose and stop thinking about just whatever falls into our minds. You can change the direction of your life by doing your own thinking on purpose and not just thinking whatever happens to fall into your brain. Women in Albania are taught to be silent and not to speak out. This is something that has come from long past ago and although many organizations uh, do advocate and do encourage women to bring it out and to um, tell the truth, it's something that has to do with the culture. If something happens to you, it's a shame factor. For some women, the Christian church is becoming a refuge, a place where they can speak freely However, less than 2% of the population are Christian, and most of them have no spiritual mothers or fathers. What I'm facing, I cannot share with my parents. They are not Christians. What I'm facing, I cannot, I do not have an adult Christian to talk to and say, is this normal, what is happening to me? Or how can I face this difficulty? Counsel is something that we lack. The first generation has just to experience everything, good or bad. And this spiritual mother for people, it's for, for the ladies and for the women, it's very important because it's somebody saying, I've gone through this way. It's painful, but you're going to make it. And this is what Joyce has been transmitting to us and giving us power to go forward. Even though there are hard times in our life, even though not everything is perfect, but we know that somebody else went through the same road, the same pain, and she made it. So we're going to make it as well.